Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this talk. My name is Velimir Vasilinov and I go by Monkey and I'll be presenting Smart Tensors, novel unsupervised machine learning framework developed at Los Alamos National Laboratory, a team effort which involved many people at Los Alamos. First, I'll start discussing why unsupervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning methods are very popular. However, they require labeling or prior knowledge about the process data. For example, it can be applied to recognize images of cats and dogs after training, but cannot recognize images of horses if not trained for that. Cannot discover something new that we don't know already in conclusion. And also, I mean, accelerate the data processing, but really replaces uh, human efforts to go through all this data. And uh, humans can do an equally good job, but just requires much more time. So it's much faster to use supervised machine learning. In contrast, unsupervised machine learning extracts hidden features or signals or signatures in the process data without any prior information. So we don't need subject matter expertise, we don't need prior knowledge, we just dump the data into algorithm and let it analyze it. Example for this is that if we're analyzing images of animals, we can distinguish uh, uh, cats features that make cats, dogs, and horses different. We're not going to be able to label these images as cats, dogs, and horses, but we'll identify uh, different type of animals uh, as A, B, or C, and after that subject matter it was, can label these animals as appropriate. So what is important is that allows data mining and discovery uh, because we might not know what kind of features unsupervised machine learning can identify in the large data sets we are analyzing. Uh, furthermore, why not supervised machine learning method? Uh, and in, First, I mean, it's important to know that we introduce subjectivity through the labeling process. Um, also, does not give us a lot of insight why different animals look different, uh, why horses are different than dogs and cats. Uh, requires big training data set. We don't know in many cases why it works. And also supervised machine learning can see it impacted by adversarial examples. And here um, is an example where image of panda, when you add a random noise, which is indistinguishable for your eyes, this image can be totally uh, considered to be a different animal. Uh, and uh, this is a major limitation of the supervised machine learning methods to science application because errors can substantially change the outcome of the results. Then many different types of applications of unsupervised machine learning methods, most of them fall in the category of data analytics and model diagnostics. And here's a list of commonly type of problems, uh, feature extraction, wine source separation, detection of anomalies, image recognition, these are very common uh, applied uh, um, method that unsupervised machine learning is used. Um, also, what I think is important that we can separate different physics processes, for example. So I'm not going to go through do this list and I'll just go to the bottom that uh, also can uh, automate and help the labeling of data sets for supervised machine learning as well. Um, smart Tensors, our framework, um, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, it's available on GitHub. Uh, there are a lot of examples, uh, scripts, um, Jupyter notebooks uh, that you can tap in. Uh, it's based on matrix tensor factorization with k-means clustering. And also we can add various different type of constraints like non-negativity, sparsity, and physics information. Uh, capable to process larger data sets. Uh, why non-negativity? And this is from the original paper in 1999 published in Nature by Lee and Sung, which introduced NMF, and they compare it with PCA. So on the top, you see the results for NMF, on the bottom, the zero results for PCA. Uh, both methods were able to very well recognize or you know, analyze the set of uh, faces. And as you can see on the top, the original face is well reconstructed by both methods. 
However, there is a difference in the features that both methods extracted. Um, in NMF case, on the top, uh, everything is between uh, white and black. White is zero, black is one, and the gray is uh, values between zero and one. As you can see, uh, the algorithm identified 49 features, dictionary 49 features, and each of these 49 features, which are shown on the left, are multiplied in some way by the matrix on the right so that the faces can be extracted. And the black dots are showing really important features. So we can see which features are important to reconstruct the face. And also we can see what type of features are reconstructed for the face. You can clearly see uh, eyebrows, you can see mouth, you can see nose. I mean, there are many well distinguished features in the face in animal. PCA, in contrast, uh, allows for negative values, which are marked as red. So red is minus one, black is again one, and white zero. So we have a lot of addition and subtraction of features to reconstruct the face. Uh, the first face in the top corner of the PCA analysis is the mean face, and all the other features are added and subtracted. So as you can see, again, we're classifying very well uh, we are producing the same reconstruction of the data with both methods. However, the NMF results are much more interpretable and much more intuitive. Uh, it's easy for us to understand which features are really needed to reconstruct the face. In the PC analysis, they're just a mixture of many, many features. Uh, why tensors? Because most of data actually is highly dimensional. Uh, we rarely deal with just uh, 2D uh, flat data. Uh, and most cases, it's 5D or even high dimensional the data that we need to analyze. So we need tools that can address high dimensional data as well, not only matrix data. And if you think about NMF as a reconstruction of phase, NTF or non-negative tensor factorization, you can think about the reconstruction of changes of the phase over time. So if you have the same image for the same person over several years, you'll be finding how the features change over time. So this is one way to think how the tensor factorization adds over the matrix factorization. Uh, the other question which would be asked, why we don't just use SVD or high order SVD? SVD really can be, cannot be applied for modern uh, dimensions, only for matrices. And there is a high order SVD method, but they are also challenging because really through high order SVD, we cannot identify exactly the number of signals that Available in the data. Here is a simple example for uh, non-negative non matrix factorization, where we have matrix X, which is reconstructed by two matrices W and H. So when you multiply W times H, you are reconstructing X. And uh, when you do a reconstruction, you know only the X matrix on the left. You don't know the W and H matrices. So you have 24 knowns, which are the uh, values uh, in X matrix, but you don't know any of the values in W and H. And also you don't know what is the number of rows in W and number of columns in H. So this is also unknown. So we need to be able to reconstruct all this information during the analysis. And here is a simple animation how NMF processes works. So it starts with random initial guesses for W and H, and after that goes through uh, uh, adjusting the values of W and H until they well reproduce the X matrix. So it's a very fast process. It's easy to uh, execute. Um, for large matrices, we need uh, much more computational power, but this gives you an idea how the factorization process works. And we get very good estimates. Um, uh, if this is the true estimate, and this is the estimate, I mean, we get we're producing very well the actual values. The truth and the estimate match very well. Um, the other thing where you can think about NMF is that you are reconstructing the conic and the convex skull of the data, and this is just how the W. I mean, you can use this W matrix, you can also the H matrix, but this example when. You, you can restrict the conic hole with W matrix. And when it's normalized, 
everything uh, lies on a plane when it's not normalized W matrix fills in the cone. Um, this is another way uh, to think what the NMF is doing when you're processing the data. Um, another example is that if you have, let's assume, three signals, which are blue, green, and uh, red, and these three signals are mixed in a known way in a series of sensors. So currently, like in this case, you have seven sensors and each of these signals are mixed. Um, you can extract them automatically. So on the right is a reconstruction of the original signals without knowing what the, uh, they are, just based on the data which is shown on the bottom. Uh, when you go to high dimensions, then you need to do tensor decomposition. And this is one simple example for 3D tensor decomposition. Um, there are two major methods for tensor decomposition, Tucker and canonical polyadic or candy comp decomposition. I'll be talking a little bit about both. But now what is important to note is that now we don't have uh, only two uh, of factors, W and H. We have three factorization matrices which are linked through this core uh, tensor in the center. So G in the center is a core tensor which uh, tells us how we need to multiply um, on the tensor with the matrices to reconstruct the original tensor. As you can see, there are much less elements uh, in um, G, W, uh, H, and B. So we also get um, obtaining compression in this process. And the um, most simple way of canonical polyadic tensor decomposition is when you have rank one tensor. So this is the simplest case of rank one tensor when you just have three vectors and when you multiply these vectors, you can reconstruct the entire tensor. This is the simplest uh, type of tensor deconstruction that you can make. Um, rank 4 will be similar. Now only we'll have um, four elements for each matrix in every single dimension. Uh, and now this uh, core tensor in the center is just diagonal. You have only diagonal elements and uh, don't have all diagonal elements. So when you're multiplying, you're really multiplying only vector by vector. You're not multiplying a cross vector between the different vectors. Um, in the full case, when you have G matrix uh, full and you have uh, values everywhere, then you have all the cross products between the vectors. Uh, but also you can have a sparse representation where just subset of um, uh, combinations between vectors need to be multiplied to reconstruct the original tensor. Um, theoretically, what is important to note is that rank one tensor, as I mentioned earlier, is a tensor product of a set of vectors in each densions, and this is the simplest case. Uh, tensor rank R, when it's higher than one, is the smallest number of rank one tensors on the canonical polyadic decomposition. Uh, tensor multi-rank is the smallest dimensions of core tensor G under Tucker decomposition. And this always exists. Uh, it's guaranteed that there is uh, core tensor G which can perform this uh, Tucker decomposition. Uh, tensor rank is always equal to the rank of Tucker tensor core. So once you do Tucker decomposition, we know what is the tensor rank of uh, the data set with your analyzing. Um, but all this is without the non-negativity constraints. When you have non-negativity constraints, things are slightly different. Um, non-negative tensor rank now will be the smallest number of uh, rank one um, non-negative tensors uh, under canonical polyadic decomposition. Uh, we also have non-negative tensor multi-rank, which is equivalent to the regular multi-rank tensor uh, multi-rank. However, here is under non-negative decomposition. However, the existence in this case is cannot be guaranteed. Uh, non-negative tensor rank is always less than or equal to the rank of non-negative Tucker cone tensor. So it's different than the case of tensor rank when they're equal. And also the non-negative tensor rank is the smallest number of non-zero entries in the tensor core on the non-negative Tucker decomposition. So all these are mathematical um, concepts which help us with our interpretation of large data sets and the extract features that we're producing.
Um, going back to the Tucker decomposition, again, the example which I showed you earlier, this is the more general case. You have a core tensor and you, you have three matrices, but also you can have much simpler versions where you're deconstructing data only in two of the dimensions, not all three dimensions, which is shown here, or you can reconstruct the data only one of dimensions, which uh, mathematically is generally equivalent to um, matrix factorization uh, when the tensors are flattened. So you can think about uh, took a one decomposition as um, alternative of non-negative matrix factorization. Also, the other way to think about took a decomposition is to think that there might be a bunch of signals in different directions. So H, W, and V, you can think about um, time series or uh, signals that propagate uh, in different dimensions of space. So, if we have X, Y, and T, for example, in three-dimensional space, then uh, different features will be representing features in X, Y, and T dimension. Um, so, in our smart tensor uh, application, uh, Tucker and CPD decomposition are achieved through minimization. We can also apply constraints in the process. And... Uh, the optimum number of features is estimated through k-means clustering of a series of minimization solutions with random initial guesses. So we don't solve the problem only once, we solve it multiple times, and every time when we solve it, we store the data, and after the k-means clustering, we analyze it to identify which is what is the optimum number of features in every single dimension. And this is computationally intensive, but I'll show you some examples how this can be done in uh, problems that we have solved recently. So here's an example that we uh, constructed just to demonstrate how it works. Um, let's assume that we have a um, different number of signals in different dimensions. The first dimension is time on the top, where we have three different temporal signals in the matrix V. One is linear dependence on T, the other one is squared, the other is third one is tange of t. After that, we have different type of signals in x direction, which are captured in the w matrix. And after that, you have different type of signals in y direction, which are captured in h matrix. When we multiply this w, g, uh, h, w, and v uh, with the core tensor g, which have 12 elements, because we have 3 by 4 by 5 problem, and we don't have uh, all the elements of the core tensor filled in. So from this 60, uh, 3 by 4 by 5 uh, uh, elements in the entire core tensor, only 12 and non uh, uh, zero. And this is the mathematical expression that we get for x. So you see, uh, I mean, this is the mathematically how the synthetic problem is generated. And after that, knowing only the data for the X tensor, we can try to reconstruct the original tensor that we are analyzing. So this is the data, so this is a movie showing the data that we are analyzing. On the right is the movie, on the left is the data, and this is the result from um, merging all these uh, signals. And our algorithm can extract uh, pretty well the features. I mean, it does not identify their mathematical expression, of course, but the shape is well captured. So we don't know the mathematical equations. We just reproduce the shape of the curves. But as you can see, the shape of the curves are matching pretty well what originally bought in synthetic problems. So only knowing the uh, X tensor, we are able to extract W, V, W, and H matrices, and also the G core tensor, which is providing how the, all these uh, features are mixed. And the other way to look at, if you look at this, um, um, for example, the three features in time, then the three features in time are modifying something which are like a dynamic matrices on the top, which are representing how uh, the X and Y features look like. So the first feature, the red one, um, he, shown here is modifying the matrix on the left. The second feature, the blue one, is modifying the matrix uh, in the center. And the third feature, the green one, is modifying the matrix on the right. And this matrix on the top, uh, the footprints of the XY features combined, flattened simultaneously. 
and the mathematical expression of these three matrices uh, represented by all the elements which are representing these x, y uh, multiplications which have this uh, specific type of uh, uh, temporal features, the three temporal features that we're dealing with. And after that we can make animations which are showing how these features are dynamically changing over time. So you know, we're extracting from the original data set three features in time and also we can see how these three features in time are represented in x, y domain and they are based on the uh, how the uh, footprints of these x, y features are uh, identified. Uh, another example is, um, let us assume that we have 50 by 50 uh, by 50 tensor, which we have 50 columns, 50 rows, and 50 time frames. And there are ones which are the red dots, which are um, swimming in a sea of zeros, which is in the movie on the right. So you can see these uh, zeros are moving through the domain. And now the goal is, can you analyze this data and identify swimmers that are moving in the same speed? And yes, we can do this. Um, so this is the data. And this is how we can sort this out, uh, swimmers that are, and we can group them together, the swimmers that which swim uh, are moving with the same speed. So the algorithm automatically identifies the group of swimmers and how they move in space. So this is another example how tensor decomposition can be applied. There are many challenges. I will not have time to go. What are the challenges of smart tensors? Of course, dealing with big data, solving non-unique optimization problems, identifying number of unknown features, dealing with noisy data. We are addressing all this in our algorithms, but um, we acknowledge the presence and importance which needs consideration when the work is done. Um, also, our algorithm scales pretty well. I mean, as has mentioned, we see it in Julia. However, we compared performing uh, tensor decomposition with TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, NumPy, and MATLAB. I mean, uh, algorithm is performing as well uh, as uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch, and much better than other uh, available tools out there. Um, we have applied smart tensors for many different types of analysis, um, uh, mostly earth sciences, but also uh, uh, many other areas, uh, including molecular dynamics and uh, phase separation of copolymers, um, um, also neutron accelerator data. And most of this uh, information about these applications is available on the website. Uh, we have a series of publications. This is a list of uh, our uh, recent work. Uh, welcome to uh, check them out or send us email if you have questions. Um, I'll just show one example re related to reactive mixing. Uh, so in this case, there is um, um, uh, two compounds, A and B, and which are separated by a barrier B, and A and B react to form C, and the reaction is controlled by um, physics processes, so mostly advection, uh, diffusion, and dispersion, and uh, uh, different model parameters which controls this mixing. So many simulations generated with random initial guesses for these five input parameters. And the goal was to see can using smart tensors or non-negative tensor factorization and identify physical processes impacting the, C, uh, the concentration of C, the reactant from A and B from the model outputs. And again, I'll run again this simulation just to give you a perspective. These are three different simulations and the three different frames, and we analyze all these simulations to extract features. And what we're able to do is um, to identify uh, um, process associated with advection, with dispersion and diffusion. We didn't know in advance what really these processes are, but the subject matter expert looking at the data is their opinion. And so this movie is showing the three extracted features for advection, dispersion, and diffusion, how they look like in time and space. And this is type of analysis that we can do um, um, very quickly with our algorithm. We can generate also the movies, but all of them are showing how the original data, which is in the up is constructed into three different uh, features on the bottom.
Um, we can also visualize in this how and this is again another way to see this is the footprints of the three features. Uh, T1 is the advection, the red one. After that, we have the blue one dispersion and uh, the third one, T3 diffusion. And this is how over time they change. And the top is the total reconstruction of the field obtained through the machine learning algorithm. And you can see we're getting pretty good reconstruction. Uh, another way to visualize the game in different type of movie with now three separate windows for uh, the footprint of the advection, dispersion, and diffusion where in the domain they are occurred. And everything is done automatically through the machine learning algorithm. So in summary, um, we developed novel and supervised machine learning method. Uh, and uh, we developed also a computational framework called uh, Smart Tensors. Um, smart Tensors have been applied to many uh, different uh, real world problems and currently we are uh, working on commercialization and deployment of smart answers on Julia Hill. Um, we have funding from DOE uh, for this work. And again, going back to our codes and examples, um, um, here are links uh, to um, our GitHub and also um, uh, they are available as a Docker, at the Docker station. So please feel free to try and test our algorithms. Uh, thank you very much.